Hey folks, if you spend any amount of time in the microbial ecology literature, you will notice that there are two approaches to looking at alpha diversity and beta diversity. In the past as several episodes, we've been looking at one approach, which involves taking our sequence data and putting them into bins. I've been using operational taxonomic units to define a bin, but we could also classify things to a genus or a family or a phylum and use those as bins and then use that data, the relative abundance of those different bins by each sample to look at things like richness, diversity, beta diversity, and so forth. Well, there's another approach and that is what's called a phylogenetic approach. In a phylogenetic approach, you take all of your sequence data and you make a phylogenetic tree out of those sequences. And then you look at the clustering within that tree. You look at the branch length of the tree uh, for each sample and again, comparing different samples. So what I wanna do in this episode and the next episode is look at these phylogenetic approaches for describing alpha and beta diversity and see how they compare back to our bin-based statistics. In this episode, we're gonna look at alpha diversity and the metric that is used for a phylogenetic approach is what's called phylogenetic diversity. So what you do is you build a tree for each sample and then with that sample's tree, uh, you then calculate the total branch length across the tree and that's your phylogenetic diversity. Proponents of phylogenetic diversity approaches uh, prefer it because it looks at the relationship of the sequences. Whereas if you put things into a bin, you lose all information, all context about how those different bins relate to each other. The challenge with phylogenetic approaches, however, is that with modern data sets, we have large data sets, right? And so it becomes increasingly just impossible really to generate a meaningful phylogenetic tree that you can use as input to these different metrics. The data set we're using here from my mouse study is small enough that I was able to build a neighbor joining tree and run it through these different phylogenetic approaches using the mother software package. So I'm using this data set as an example, uh, but know that if you try this with your own data, it might not be tractable because your data set might just be too big and it might just suck up all the RAM on your computer. This episode, we're gonna look at phylogenetic diversity at the alpha diversity scale, we're gonna use output from mother and compare it to what we're getting out of vegan when we rarefy our data. Over here in our studio, I now have a blank phylogeneticdiversity.r script. As always, if you wanna get the code and the data down below, there's a link in the description to help you get going. I've also got a video that'll give you instructions for how you can use that information in the blog post to get caught up. As always, we'll also do library tidyverse uh, to load all the goodness from the tidyverse package. And I'm gonna start by reading in the phylogenetic diversity data so we can see what that looks like. And so what I will do is read TSV, because it's a TSV file, and it's my data directory. Um, let me go ahead and open that data directory over here in our studio for you to see. And what we want is this mice phylodiv.rarefaction file. Uh, yes, phylogenetic diversity is also sensitive to sampling effort, so it needs to be rarefied. We're not gonna go back into that, but just trust me on this. Uh, so we'll then do mice.phylodiv. Uh, Rarefaction, reading that in, we then get a 659 row by 361 columns. The columns are our different samples. The rows are the number of sequences that were sampled. You can see that it basically outputs every 100 sequences. There are some values in between those, and that's for samples that perhaps didn't have more than 15 sequences in them. So we clearly wanna get rid of those. So what we need to do is figure out what sequencing depth we want to use for our analysis. So I'll go ahead and do a poll on num sampled so we can see the full range of values there. And so I'm gonna look back through this vector of sequencing depths and we're looking for the oddball values. And so what I want actually is this 1804 um, because the next smallest data set is actually this 1414. So that 1,804 is what I want. You'll notice that this number is a little bit different than what we've been using in previous episodes. That's okay, there's just slight differences. I had to rerun Mother to generate this file. Um, I've also put an updated version of the shared file in this data directory. So we're gonna use 1,804 for this analysis. And so I will then do filter num sampled equals equals 1,804. This then gives me that row. So I'll go ahead and do pivot longer on everything but the num sampled column. And we'll do names to uh, the group column. And then the values uh, to, I will do phylo uh, div. And so now we see we've got num sampled, our group and our phylo div. I don't want that num sampled column. So I'll go ahead and do a select uh, minus num sampled. And there we go. We have our table with our group as well as our phylogenetic diversity that's been rarefied to 1,804 sequences per sample. 
I will go ahead and call this philo div um, as my data frame. And now what I need is some comparison that I can use a bin-based metric to compare back to this phylogenetic diversity. So we've seen things like this before, uh, and so we'll kind of quickly go through that, but we'll do read tsv uh, data forward slash mice dot shared, and I'll go ahead and do a select on group and anything that starts with uh, OTU. And so again, if you look at my column names here, that'll be the group as well as all those OTU columns. And I will then do a pivot longer on everything but group. All right, so I've got that tibble. Now I wanna remove any sample that has fewer than 1,804 sequences. So I'll go ahead and do a group by group. And then I'll do a mutate n equals sum on value. And so then this gives me that column with my n. And I can, of course, do an ungroup uh, to remove that group grouping. And then I can do a filter, and I can then do a filter for n greater than or equal to 1804. And so now I've removed those smaller data sets. And now what I want to do is expand this back out wide to make a data frame. And so I'll do a select minus n, and I will then do pivot wider uh, with the names from, uh, it's going to be the name column and values from being the value column. And just to double check, yeah, we have name and value there. So that'll be good. And so now we're back to our wide data frame that only has those samples that we are interested in carrying forward. Column to row names with the group column. So we now have a data frame that we can use as input to the vegan package functions. And so I'm gonna come to the top of this pipeline and call it OTU data. And I will also come back up to the top of my script and I will add a library uh, vegan. I'll now rarify that OTU data frame by taking OTU data and piping it into rarify. And I want my sample value to be 1804. So I wanna get 1804 sequences from each of my samples. I now get out a vector with the expected number of OTUs that I would see sampling 1804 sequences from each of my samples. I do get a decimal number uh, because again, this you could think of this as like an average of say a thousand uh, resamplings of the community. Uh, under the hood, vegan isn't doing resamplings. It has like an empirical formula that it's using that we talked about in a previous episode. I can then turn this into a tibble by doing as tibble, and I can then say row names equals group. So this then gives me a data frame with a column for my group and the value. I'd really rather that value be richness. So let's do select on group and richness equals value. And so again, now we have richness as our column, and I'm gonna go ahead and call this richness. I would like to get a third metric of alpha diversity. So we have the phylogenetic diversity from the phylogenetic approach. We have richness, which again is the number of different taxa that we see. I would also like to get the rarefied Shannon diversity. Uh, I know we've talked about this in previous episodes, but I think it'll be a good comparison. And of course, it'll be a great review for thinking about how we would rarefy uh, diversity estimate like Shannon um, using our OTU data. So to get rarefied Shannon diversity data, I'm gonna start with my OTU data data frame, and I'm gonna pipe that to R rarefy, and I'll do sample equals 1804. So R rarefy will do one subsampling of the community. Again, it outputs a data frame. I can then pipe this into the diversity function, which the default calculator for diversity is the Shannon diversity estimate. And so now we get Shannon diversity values for each of our different samples. I now want to repeat this say a thousand times so I can get the average of these subsampled uh, Shannon diversity values. To do that, I'm gonna turn this three line uh, block into a function, and then I'm gonna repeat that a thousand times and then output the average of all of that. So I will call this Shannon iteration, uh, and that will be a function. And it's not gonna take any arguments and I'm gonna wrap this uh, body with my curly braces. And I'll just go ahead and indent this so it looks pretty. <laughs> um, and I will load Shannon iteration. So again, if I run Shannon iteration, I will get one iteration. And if I keep running this, I'll get different Shannon diversity values every time I run it. So instead of rerunning that function a thousand or a hundred times, I can use a function called replicate. So I'll do replicate, and then the n is the number of replicates I wanna do. I'm gonna do 100 to keep it relatively simple. And then I'll do Shannon iteration. 
Oops, so what I get is a list 100 units long that is repeating the body of my function each time, right? So what I actually want to give this is the expression. And so that's going to be Shannon iteration with its own parentheses so that it's running Shannon iteration each of those 100 times. So this outputs a matrix and you can see the row names are my different samples and I then get 100 columns for each of the 100 iterations. So what I now want to do is I want to take this array and I want to turn it into a tibble. And so I will then do as a tibble and I'll do row names equals group. So I get a warning message after adding that as tibble statement to my pipeline. And that is because my columns uh, in the output of the replicate don't have names, they're numbers, right? And so what I could add here is an argument that would be period name repair equals unique uh, in quotes. And that will make sure that all of my columns have unique names. So I will I'll run that and so we'll see what that does. But for now, I'm also gonna add a pivot uh, longer on everything but the group column. And let's go ahead and see what that looks like because ultimately what we're gonna to wanna to do next is take each group, let's go ahead and do it now, <laughs> and we'll do a group by group. Uh, and then we'll do a summarize. Uh, we'll do Shannon equals the mean of the value column. So that outputted some information about what it did with those column names that I don't really care about. What I care about is Shannon. And so now I get that tibble that has the group name and the Shannon. Now I've got three data frames. I got one for phylogenetic diversity, one for the richness, and one for Shannon. And I wanna bring those all together. So we'll do inner join on uh, phylo div uh, and richness, and we'll do it by the group column. And then we'll do another inner join uh, with all that stuff plus the Shannon data frame with the by equaling group. And so sure enough, now what we get is a data frame that's got the group column, the phylogenetic diversity, the richness, and the Shannon. And I wanna know how do the bin-based metrics compare back to phylogenetic diversity? So I will go ahead and call this pipeline combined. And what we can begin to do is to think about making plots where we can plot, say, the bin-based metric on the x-axis and, say, phylogenetic diversity on the y. And so I'll do combined pipe to ggplot AES. And so let's start with x being richness, y being phylo div, uh, and then let's do geom point. And I'm gonna go ahead and add in the geom smooth. So we'll get a line through the data to see what it looks like. And so again, we see richness across the x-axis, phylogenetic diversity on the y-axis. And it, it appears like a fairly strong positive correlation between richness and phylogenetic diversity. Great. So let's try this also with Shannon on the x-axis. So this appears to have some positive trajectory to it. Um, there are these smaller uh, Shannon values that are kind of throwing off the appearance just a bit. Maybe what we could do instead would be to filter those out. Uh, so we could, we could do this a couple ways. I'm gonna go ahead and use the filter function. I'll do filter uh, Shannon greater than two, uh, add that to my pipeline, and so you know, it, it, it's not a very strong positive correlation like we saw before uh, with the richness like this one here. Um, but there is still a bit of a positive trajectory. Um, and so it doesn't appear that Shannon is super strongly correlated with uh, phylogenetic diversity. We'll come back and quantify that here in a moment. Uh, but what we'd maybe also like to do is let's go ahead and uh, copy that. I'm going to remove that filter line for now. And on the X, I'm going to put Shannon and Y, I'm going to put richness. And so what we see here um, is a pretty strong trajectory actually uh, between Shannon and richness. So let me go ahead and put that filter back in so that we're not kind of getting things so skewed by those low uh, diversity samples. And so this shows a very strong, I think, positive correlation between richness and Shannon. And ultimately that's because when we rarefy our data, the richness that we're measuring is actually more of a metric of diversity rather than just straight up pure richness. Um, so anyway, it's interesting to see that positive correlation there. So what I'd like to do now is take combined this data frame and I wanna look at the correlation between the different columns. And to look at a correlation, what we can do is the core.test function. And so we can give it two variables. So we'll give it combined dollar sign phylo div and combined dollar sign richness. 
This then very quickly outputs uh, the results of running a correlation test. The default is the Pearson's correlation. I think I'd rather use the Spearman. And so what I'll do is method equals quote Spearman. Uh, Spearman is a non-parametric test. This then gives us a row of about 0.465. I think before with Pearson, we're getting 0.535. I feel like the Spearman is a little bit more honest. We get this warning message that the p-value, um, we can't get an exact p-value when you have ties and values. So the p-value we get is minuscule. That's clearly different from zero. That's what it's testing. Is this row value significantly different from zero? Yes. And if you don't want that warning message, you could always go ahead and do exact equals false. That then gets rid of that warning message. So let's go ahead and repeat this for the different alpha diversity metrics. So I'll do Philo Div and Shannon, and I'll also do richness and Shannon. So if we run these three tests, what we'll find is that we have a very strong correlation as we expect from the plot between Shannon and richness of row of 0.88. Um, for phylogenetic diversity and Shannon, the row was about 0.31. It's still positive, but not nearly as strong as what we saw before, what we saw uh, here between phylogenetic diversity and richness. And so perhaps the relationship between the phylogenetic approach and these bin-based metrics of alpha diversity isn't as strong as you might hope for to say, well, I'm not gonna worry about phylogenetic diversity, I'm only gonna worry about the bin-based methods. Still, like I said, I have yet to see a case with my data and really looking at data from the literature where I see a, a really compelling difference between results using phylogenetic approaches and bin-based approaches for alpha diversity. I hope that you get something out of this, even if you don't care about bin-based methods or phylogenetic methods. This again, I think is a really good review of a lot of the things we've been doing with vegan in recent weeks, combining things from base R, combining things with dplyr and ggplot and the overall tidyverse. You can again, hopefully see how I approach a problem. Again, this question of how do phylogenetic and bin-based methods relate to each other. In the next episode, I'm going to use the unifrac metrics, the unweighted and the weighted metrics, and compare them to bin-based metrics like Bray Curtis and Jacquard to see how well they correlate with each other. So that you don't miss that episode or any of the fun stuff I have on tap, please be sure that you subscribe to this channel, you click the bell icon so you get a notification, and more than anything, please give this video a thumbs up and tell your friends about what you're doing here. Keep practicing and we'll see you next time.